First up will be Dr. John Wilsey. He serves as Associate Professor of Church History at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and as an Affiliate Scholar of Theology and History at the Acton Institute. Uh, he is spending this academic year as the William E. Simon Fellow in Religion and Public Life at the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He is the author of several articles and editorials in addition to One Nation Under God, an Evangelical Critique of Christian America, American Exceptionalism and Civil Religion, Reassessing the History of an Idea, as, and also something he will speak a lot about today, an abridgment of Tocqueville's Democracy in America. He is currently working on a religious biography of the former uh, United States Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. And if you are a foreign policy buff, and there are four or five I'm looking at right now over there, and I'm one of them, this will be a real treat to see this uh, biography. Uh, a, a, a very important figure that often is overlooked, and often his brother gets more attention, unless you're flying into the airport. The airport's after John, right? Not Alan. <clears throat> so, John, would you lead off for us? Thank you so much, Paul, and uh, thank you uh, to the Acton Institute for inviting me to come. It's always uh, a great privilege to speak at Acton events. You meet the most interesting people uh, and um, just enjoyed a great conversation over at uh, table during lunch and uh, dinner at last night and just it's just marvelous. So thank you very much. <clears throat> um, on September 12th, 1848, uh, Alexei de Tocqueville gave a speech to the Chamber of Deputies, of which he was a member. Uh, 1848 would have been um, 17 years after he had visited America on his famous nine-month tour of the United States. Um, it was 13 years after his first volume of Democracy in America came out in published form, and it was eight years after his second volume of Democracy in America came out. He had been elected to the chamber as a representative from, and I am about to butcher French, so if you speak French or you are from France, I apologize. I am a Georgian, uh, and so I'm going to destroy the French uh, language here. Valone, so sorry, um, ducking from tomatoes and things coming at me, uh, which is a small town near Cherbourg, which is very easy to pronounce, uh, and close to the Tocqueville Chateau. Uh, he was elected in 1839. And he served until 1852. Um, and he gave this speech uh, to the Chamber of Deputies where he contrasted socialism with democracy. And he used observations from American democracy to lend credibility and clarity to his contrast. And this is what he said. No, gentlemen, democracy and socialism are not indissolubly bound together. They are not only different but also opposed. Democracy extends the sphere of individual independence. Socialism restricts it. Democracy gives each man his full value. Socialism turns each man into an agent, an instrument, a cipher. Democracy and socialism intersect in but a single word, equality. But note the difference. Democracy wants equality in liberty. Socialism wants equality in bondage and servitude. It is a short segment of his speech that he gave, but it is pregnant with meaning and relevance for today. So in what follows, we're going to consider this contrast, particularly as it relates to how Tocqueville saw uh, self-interest rightly understood and how that doctrine in particular helps to preserve liberty. We will glean some wisdom from Tocqueville's observations for our own day as we consider how we are in a position to preserve liberty in our context. Tocqueville believed that it was through the doctrine of self-interest rightly understood that liberty is preserved in a democracy through the mitigating effects of materialism and selfishness that threaten to prevail because of equality of conditions, which is inherent in a democracy. Tocqueville insisted 
that socialism is materialistic. So a socialist society denies, for example, the existence of the soul, the existence of God, the existence of a transcendent moral law, etc. But American democracy maintains a balance between the needs of the body and of the soul. Self-interest rightly understood, according to Tocqueville, is animated by a spirit of religion. And it's religion that prevents democracy from devolving into a socialistic tyranny. So for Tocqueville, socialism is concerned only with the pursuit of wealth which gratifies only physical desires. Remember that socialism being, uh, emphasizing more materialism, mater a materialistic worldview. But democracy is concerned with the pursuit, not just of wealth, but of prosperity, which balances the needs of the body and the spirit. So in order to be truly prosperous, your body thrives and your spirit thrives along with it. This is the definition of true prosperity, not, not just, not merely the pursuit of wealth for wealth's sake. So the doctrine of self-interest, rightly understood, is the key to striking the balance between body and soul. So self-interest, rightly understood, for Tocqueville and democracy in America, uh, mitigates the influence of equality of conditions on a democracy. At the intersection of private good and public interest, you have self-interest rightly understood. Now, think back to the founding of the Republic. Late 18th century, the founders, particularly someone like George Washington. We often think of the founders as advocating for virtue as the one necessary component in an enlightened republic. And certainly, that is something that they advocated. Washington himself was famous for what he uh, called often in his career disinterestedness. Disinterestedness for Washington did not mean that he was apathetic, but rather uh, he was trying to take an objective uh, view of the situation, trying to be circumspect. He was always someone that, that knew that everything that he did, especially when he was the president, everything that he did was precedent setting. Everything that he did was going to be imitated by his, his successors. So he had an awareness. He had a, he had a, a foresight, an historical awareness of his, own, of his own role. And so he believed that disinterestedness was a virtue for him in particular to pursue. The founders thought that virtue was necessary for the maintenance of the republic, but by the 1830s, by Tocqueville's time, virtue was not seen as being so important by most Americans. Remember, this is the beginning of the age of Jackson. Jackson is elected president in 1828. Tocqueville didn't think of Americans as being particularly virtuous. And he wasn't the only foreign visitor to think so. Charles Dickens famously said in the 1840s that Americans were not very virtuous. He called Washington, D.C. that the tobacco-tinctured capital of the New Republic. Um, but Tocqueville was interested in the practical benefits of virtue. and He was particularly interested in the way Americans saw the practical benefits of being virtuous. So when virtue and self-interest are the same, when virtue and, and selfishness, if you want to say it that way, converge, then you have uh, the, the ingredients of self-interest rightly understood. Tocqueville wrote in volume two, in the United States, hardly anybody talks of the beauty of virtue, but they maintain that virtue is useful and they prove it every day. So what is it? What is interest rightly understood? For Tocqueville, it is not self-sacrifice uh, self for a larger benefit for the sake of self-sacrifice, right? So in the panel earlier today, we were, we were talking about the absurdity of the virtue of paying more in taxes. What was it, the joy 
of uh, paying a, a more tax, voluntary taxation, these kinds of things. Uh, if you recall, uh, during the, the, the recent presidential campaign, uh, Bill Clinton standing behind a podium and saying that, uh, you know, for people like me, you know, he's a very wealthy person. People like me, we, we ought to give more in taxes. We should, you know, it's, it's the patriotic thing to do. Uh, the idea that rich people should pay more in taxes because it's patriotic, even though it goes against their self-interest, well, Tocqueville thought that that was absurd. That's not self-interest rightly understood. That's disingenuous. If you do something that goes against your self-interest, that's not an American thing to do. Right? This is what Tocqueville is saying. Rather, self-sacrifice for the larger benefit when there is something for the individual to gain, something immediate to gain, and worth it. Right. So I might not spurn jury duty if I receive pay that is worth the time I sacrifice for my job, right? I might vote in support of a bond proposal benefiting the local high school if I knew my 16-year-old was going to have the best teacher's money could buy. I might support higher pay for recycling center workers if I knew I wouldn't have to sort my own recyclables. I might contribute more money to charity if I knew that I could write off my contributions on my taxes. Uh, Bill McClay, who was here this morning on the panel, he called, uh, he called this in his book, The Masterless, a halfway covenant to coax vice into paying willing tribute to virtue. Interest rightly understood for Tocqueville, as he observed it, <clears throat> uh, does not promote singular acts of virtue, but it does forestall total selfishness among the citizenry. This is what he said in, in volume two describing this. He says, interest rightly understood produces no great acts of self-sacrifice. By itself, it cannot suffice to make a man virtuous. It prevents men from rising far above the level of mankind, but a great number of other men who were falling far below it are caught and restrained by it. So with regard to commerce, with regard to economic activity, Tocqueville observes that self-interest, rightly understood, motivates Americans to pursue wealth honestly, even if their pursuit of wealth could turn into an obsession. He noticed that Americans view work as being dignified in and of itself. And I want to read to you another, another uh, passage from Democracy in America from Volume 2 that I think is very significant in terms of how Americans viewed work and the dignity of work and that relationship to self-interest rightly understood. So he says this, in America, no one is degraded because he works, for everyone around him works also, nor is anyone humiliated by the notions of receiving pay. For the President of the United States also works for pay. He is paid for commanding and other men are paid for obeying orders. In the United States, professions are more or less laborious, more or less profitable, but they are never either high or low. Every honest calling is honorable. That's a beautiful, a beautiful statement about the dignity of work. So self-interest rightly understood has also a transcendent basis that Tocqueville notices. It's not merely for pragmatic reasons that Americans perform uh, what he called daily acts of self-sacrifice for the good of the community. There is a transcendent basis for self-interest rightly understood. Let me explain. Tocqueville recognized that if this doctrine of self-interest rightly understood was merely this worldly, merely materialistic, it would lack sufficient power to check the forces of selfishness and materialism. Self-interest rightly understood is really seen. It really shows up in relief when a person is talking about mortality, death. Right? When we face our mortality, self-interest rightly understood becomes in clear relief. Christianity teaches that all humans have a responsibility to God for the content of their beliefs 
and of their behavior. Tocqueville is also deeply influenced by and taken with Pascal's wager, the famous wager. Uh, Tocqueville writes in volume two, to be mistaken in believing that the Christian religion is true, says Pascal, is no great loss to anyone. But how dreadful to be mistaken in believing it to be false, right? This is the wager, right? That I have more to gain through faith than I do to have the faith that Christianity is true than I do to have faith that it is, it is false. And so the, the wager is it's, it's better to bet on, better to bet that Christianity is true, right? So human striving can be put to good ends here on earth, but that striving must also be towards eternity. So self-interest rightly understood balances the interests of earth, the interests of our daily life, the daily grind, with those of eternity. Where will we spend uh, eternity? Well, we want to spend eternity in heaven, don't we? Don't we all? Wouldn't we all agree? Does any raise your hand if you want to go to eternal perdition? Well, none of us do. It's in our self-interest to pursue righteousness, right? This is the way Tocqueville would say it, in order to live in eternity in heaven, right? Not, not to go to hell. That's, that's not in our self-interest. He says, the heart of man is vaster than people imagine, which is really an amazing statement, by the way, just to take that on its own. The heart of man is vaster than people imagine. Uh, Tocqueville says that socialist, a socialist would never <laughs> embrace that idea because of materialism. He goes on to say, it can entertain both a taste for the goods of this earth and a love for the goods of heaven at the same time. Right? So just as Professor Turnbull was saying in his, in his lecture, th there, is no, uh, there is no inherent contradiction between the pursuit of private property and the pursuit of the common good. Right? This, is, this is a very Tocquevillian idea as well. He says, uh, he says, in the United States, religion exercises but little influence upon the laws and upon the details of public opinion. But it does direct the customs of the community, and by regulating domestic life, it regulates the state. What does he mean by this? The religious influence on the doctrine of self-interest, rightly understood, is felt specifically through the customs, or what Tocqueville says, calls the mores, or he calls them also the habits of the heart, uh, the, uh, the, the value system, maybe in today's language we would call it that. I hate that expression, but nevertheless, let's use it uh, for purposes today, right? The, the culture, what the culture values, uh, the mores, the manners, the customs of the community. Uh, it's through the customs that you see the influence of religion on self-interest rightly understood. And religion is mediated to interest through Christian morality, as Tocqueville sees it in the 1830s. So through, for example, marriage, through American family life, just ordinary family life uh, that Americans are going through in their lives, religion informs the customs that undergird the political, the social, the economic life of the republic. So marriage and family life are indispensable to the success of commerce and politics in America. He recognizes this. He observes this, and he writes this up. Uh, for example, at the heart of fidelity in the home, faithfulness in the home, is the virtue of courage. Courage motivates one to take risks in order to make money, but it also motivates one to make certain sacrifices for the good of others. Christian morality is learned from who? The Puritans, the Puritans of New England, who Tocqueville sees as the spiritual fathers of the American nation. He says that the Puritans are the most American uh, of all the Americans in history. Uh, James Schlieffer wrote that self-interest, rightly understood, helps turn individuals into citizens, as he interprets Tocqueville's meaning. Informed by self-interest rightly understood, Americans are enabled to pursue prosperity, a balance between private and public, body and soul, individual and family, rather than merely wealth for wealth's sake, which is, in contrast, 
what socialism is concerned with, as Tocqueville said in his speech to the Chamber of Deputies. So in that way, American democracy favors liberty because it seeks the flourishing of the human person in its totality, not just the pursuit of money for its own sake. So to conclude, I just have a couple of minutes left here. For Tocqueville, socialism and democracy are driven by equality of conditions. Uh, and equality of conditions is a departure from a many centuries uh, old tradition of feudalism and a turn to democracy. And of course, he says in Democracy in America that uh, this change, this turn from aristocracy and feudalism to equality of conditions and democracy is, is foreordained by God. This is part of a world movement that is uh, undergirded by the providential hand of God. But he says socialism tends towards slavery because equality of conditions drives people in a relentless pursuit of wealth for its own sake to the neglect of all other concerns. But democracy tends towards liberty although it can always end up as despotism. And here's the thing that I want to close with. How, does, how, how do we seek to avoid despotism in a, de, in a democracy? Democracy tends towards, uh, if democracy is, is, is tends towards liberty, right, through self-interest rightly understood, but, but if democracy is, there's a risk, the risk is still there for uh, tyranny of the majority and, a, and a, a despotism, then how do we safeguard against that? Interestingly enough, we're all sitting here in this room together enjoying this Acton Institute event. This is, this is the way we do it, through voluntary associations, through political and civic associations, gathering together, getting to know one another. I got to know some lovely people at my table who I didn't know before, uh, building relationships with people uh, who are of different backgrounds. You know, we don't have all of us the same uh, uh, religious beliefs necessarily. We, we some of us maybe come from a uh, an Eastern Orthodox tradition, or a Roman Catholic tradition, or a Protestant tradition, or a Jewish tradition. Maybe somebody in this room here is maybe even not a non-believer of anything, an atheist. That's okay. We can have those differences and work together, despite those differences, to the goal of economic and religious freedom, which is what the Acton Institute is dedicated to. That's the genius of voluntary associations. And one of the ways that we learn self-interest rightly understood is through the practice of working together with people who don't maybe share every single idea in common with us, right? Which is genius and marvelous. That's why associations like the Acton Institute are so necessary and, and so beneficial. So vigilance is required of the citizenry. We can't become complacent. We can't just decide, well, we'll just vote every two to four years and that'll be our civic practice. No, we have to be involved. We have to be involved on our, in, our, in our local townships. We have to be involved as much as we can in our local communities because this is where democracy is the most pure, according to Tocqueville. But we also, we also are involved in political and civic associations. Things like Acton, Things like our churches. In our churches, we disagree with people in our churches about a whole number of things, but we're engaged in a common cause in church. We learn how to work with people that are not exactly like us in the pursuit of a common goal, and that is how we secure our liberty and avoid tyranny for Tocqueville. So uh, I think it's a great way to, to close uh, this, this presentation. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to the, uh, to the other panelists. Thank you, John.